imagine life without you. We need you more than ever. We need you to be present in our lives. We need to hear your voice. We need to understand your ways. We need you to take complete control of our circumstances. And so now in this hour, God, we pray that you will have your way. Make your presence known. Make your love felt. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Well, there, there's some formalities and things that, that go on whenever you have these situations. You know, you have a lot of thanks that goes out to people that help you get to the point. And of course, um, I'm forever indebted and grateful to my pastor, Terrence Autry, who has allowed me the opportunity to speak before you at this time. I got to tell you, though, when he told me, he goes, yeah, we're splitting the men up, so it'll be mostly women in there. You talk about nervous. I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe. <laughs> How are you going to do your boy like that, man? And this, <laughs> but, but nonetheless, then I thought, my wife said, oh, you'll just have the smarter group in there. You'll be okay. <laughs> and so um, my mom doesn't get to come out often, but my mom and my mother-in-law are here, my aunt are here, so, you know, certainly glad that they could come. I never said this, so I'm going to take this opportunity. My mom, when I was in high school, I was a you know, star athlete on the football team. You know, my mom made me miss a game because our game fell on a Sunday, and I had to go to church. And so, uh, needless to say, we lost, but mom, I'm, I'm, still, <laughs> I'm still working on forgiveness in that area, but I love you, Ness. Ness. Since we don't have a lot of time, I want to make sure that we cover everything that we have. There's a lot of stuff, and so... Um, what we want to do today is let me kind of set the, the tone for our objective for the day so that we can follow along. All right, so we want to take a look at three things today, right? The type of test that we faced, the things needed to handle those tests, and then lastly, well, how do we get it? How do, how do we get those things that we need? So that's the objective. Here's our scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. When we look at our verse, we're hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. It simply implies that walking the life of a Christian is not void of trials and tests. Just because you signed up on the Jesus wagon does not mean that you are exempt. And oftentimes when we travel, we think that that's the way it's going to be. Yes, Note to self right here. The closer you get to living in your purpose, the closer you get to your goal, the harder it's going to be. When stuff is all in disarray and in chaos, it seems that trouble is non-existent. But the moment you start taking a step forward and another step forward, before you know it, you find yourself repeating the cliche, it seems like every time I take two steps forward, I get not two steps backwards, right? And that's how we feel. Contrary to popular belief, belief as a, as a, as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, as a Christian, we, we, we came with, hopefully, the focus being on Christ, right? We, we, we came, and that was supposed to be the focus. But some of us came because we were at church on Sunday morning, and they were preaching about them blessings, right? Where can I get some more of them blessings? I need some of them blessings. I can't live without my blessings, then life happens. Situations, circumstances on every hand. Right. Ideally, we want our faith to grow in a linear trajectory that allows us to live in total trust of God. There's a slide there, right? We want to see our faith grow in a linear trajectory upward. But really, if we're honest, 
our faith looks more sometimes like the bottom line, like weight loss, right? It goes up and down. It ebbs and flows, right? Anybody ever tried to lose weight? One minute you down, I'm down six pounds. The very next week, I'm up nine pounds, right? <laughs> and you just go back and forth and back and forth. And the tendency when this happens is for us to feel disconnected in God. But the thing that you need to understand about the bottom line of faith, it's where our focus is at. It doesn't, the line still goes upward. We're still growing. But it's because of those valleys that we experience sometimes. It's because of those situations that we experience sometimes that we find ourselves in a place where we feel disconnected and lost. So, the question then becomes, what does your faith look like? You have to ask yourself and study internally where you are. And it's not a point for you to get lost. It, it, it's going to, I don't care how big your Bible is, how many Sundays in a row you've made it to church, there's going to be some times where your faith is tested. And that's just, that's just real. There's going to be some times where your, your faith is tested. Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. When reading the text, for myself, the first thing I asked was, why do we need two books? That's the first and second Corinthians, right? Why, why do we need two of them? I mean, what was going on? Like, Paul, you couldn't get this done in one letter. It took, it took more letters to, to, to reach the audience. It took more to get. Why do we need that? Did he have more to say? The question becomes that verse, hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down, not destroyed. How do we get there? All right, some audience participation. Repeat after me. Smiley. Smiley. How do we get to verse 8? See, I knew this was the intelligent crowd. I'm so glad you asked that question. That's a brilliant question as to how we got to verse 8. Here it is. Understanding some of the background. All right, so Paul goes to Corinth, leaves and continues on in God's work. Now, he's supposed to return, right? The church at Corinth, he establishes a church there. It's a weld oiled machine. They are rocking in their spiritual gifts. Not only is there infrastructure of how they do things in place, but spiritually, they got it going on. They are the Christ community of that time. It's a bad church. Everybody wants to go there. It's the, it's the popping thing. It's where everybody wanted, wanted, wants to go. And then when we look back, we discover that there's these letters. There's an exchange Right? I thought that Paul just wrote a letter. This is a back and forth dialogue. There's, a, there's an exchange. Paul writes a letter, the church responds. If we put, you know how long it would take to get a letter in those days? I mean, like if I was writing a letter and you're halfway or four or 500 miles away, you, there's no Pony Express, there's no FedEx, right? You're not getting that. Or you have to catch word of somebody who was traveling, right? Well, if we put that in modern times, it would be a text message, right? It would be a text message, right? So the church at Corinth sends a text, right? <laughs> so they send a text, right? And it says, hey, we, got, we have this influx of people going on around here. There's all of these temptations through us, uh, around us now. We don't really understand what's going on. Not to mention, they start to have internal hurt within the church. You got believers suing believers. You got uh, lawsuits going on. You got all kinds of turmoil and issues inside of the church. And in this moment of anxiety, in this moment of pressure, they are feeling the pressure all around them. They are feeling the pressure caving in on every single side. And Paul's not there, right? That's a note to self right there. Sometimes when you get disconnected from your source, that's when you feel the pressure the most. Have you ever been, said to yourself, you know what? Everything started to go hey wire when I stopped going to church. Everything started to fall out of line when I stopped reading my Bible. Everything started to go in a different direction when I stopped doing something. So soon as we get away from it, we find things start to unravel. But here's the good news. So Paul, once we get this text message, Paul responds with verse 8. He really does it in the entire chapter, or from the beginning all the way up to chapter 4. You can, you can kind of hear it in there. But he responds to their anxiety. He responds to their confusion. He responds to them not understanding. He responds to them feeling like we've fallen by the wayside and we're no longer loved. 
But Paul just reassures him that the same God that I told you about, the same God that we discovered together, the same God that I introduced you to, the same God that established your church is the same God that loves you today. The same, the same power that gave you the ability to operate in your spiritual gift then is the same power that, can, that, that gives it to you now. It's simply a response. Notice this. When we read the text, Paul says, we are hard pressed. We are hard pressed on every side. Not only is he talking to the church, but Paul is also telling his own story. We know biblically Paul went through some stuff. And sometimes we just need to re recognize what God has done for us. Take a look at our situations. You say to yourself, wait a minute. This is not God's first dance with this situation. This is not my first time with my back against the wall. This is not the first time I had to walk, deal with people walking out on me. It's not the first time I didn't know where the money was going to come from. It's not the first time I've been laid on my back with an illness that doctors said they didn't really know what the cure was. It's not the first time that my child has been lost and I didn't know where they were at. It's not the first time I've had people within my family not get along with me for this, that, and the other reason. It's not the first time that I've been judged unfairly because of the color of my skin. As a matter of fact, if I were to take it to even further, it's not the first time that I've doubted. But in all of those times, we walk away understanding one simple thing, that God is sufficient. We walk away understanding that if he did it before, to what? God built you to last. So let's take a look at these trials, right? So we're Christians. We're all going to face some trials. We're all going to go through some stuff. So let's look at these eight types of trials that we fall, fall into. Now, when you find the one that you're dealing with the most right now, just jump up, do a backflip, say, man, whatever it is you got to do, right? <laughs> Fiery trials, in, in, intense encounters or struggles, burst of anger. Grief, lust, infirmities, physical limitations, illnesses. Anybody ever been sick and God healed you? Mm -hmm. Reproaches, ridicule and rejection on the account of faith or holiness. Jesus dealt with a whole bunch of that, huh? Persecution, harassment and oppression due to religious convictions. What about, what about necessities? Just the everyday Wear and tear of living. Just the wear and everyday wear and tear of living. Distress, disappointments, deep hurts, tribulations, unusual pleasure, pr pressures, and challenges. And then lastly, temptations to yield to our sinful nature. If we're honest, we've all dealt with one, two, three, maybe, maybe even all of them at some point, right? And even if we're being totally honest right now, Sunday morning when you woke up and walked through the doors at Christ Community, you may be dealing with some of these right now as we speak. And they're, they're, they're never ending. They're always there. You'll find, yourself, you'll find yourself singing that song. Y'all remember that song? Don't push me because I'm close to it. I'm not to. <laughs> I was waiting on it. I was waiting on it. That's how we are, right? Stuff happens. And we find ourselves at the edge. And we're just trying to make sure we don't go over. 
So here's the deal. We got our eight trials, right? Let's look at the four things needed to deal with these. The very first thing we need is some physical ability. And here you can put Isaiah 40, chapters 30 through 31. They that wait on the Lord will renew their some physical ability. You don't believe, just ask the sister who's a mother, a wife, a student, and an employee. Even though she's tired at the end of the day, she still has to perform all of those duties. Ask the mother, strength, physical strength. Ask the mother who finds her child trapped underneath the car and somehow, some way, finds the strength to move or lift an object that she physically is not strong enough to move. And the, and the great thing about the strength of women, and, and maybe, maybe some, somebody can help me out in here, is when you've got to do all of that, you've got to carry a nine to five, you've got to take care of all of the kids, you've got to wash and cook and clean, and, and then we, the man, we come home, right, and fall on the couch, and as soon as we get a cough, like we laid out, like <laughs> can't do anything, can't function, laid up for three days, you know, it's, it's the worst thing ever. And the whole time, you're looking at, look at this big sorry fool, right? <laughs> Just shaking your head. Now you caught a cold because you were taking care of him and got to run around and do the same thing. Physical ability. The next thing that we need is some mental... <laughs> we're going to move right along from that. Don't y'all tell them... Don't, if y'all tell them that I said that, <laughs> let, wait a minute, time out. Let's, let's establish some rules. I've got to go back in there as a man. Please, please allow me to keep my man card, right? Don't, don't have them pull it. Okay, okay. Mental preservation. That's number two. We need some mental preservation. You can put here Romans 8 and 28. We know that for those who love, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Joy is not a feeling. It's a focus. A lot of times as we travel through life expecting some joy, it's because we're focused on the feeling that we get from joy while we're in the midst of the situation. It may be an uncomfortable situation, but if we're, foc if we're looking for joy in the feeling, it feels uncomfortable, and we don't look for joy in the focus, we will never have true joy. True joy comes in the fact that you're focused on the outcome, which gives you the mental preservation to go through what you're going through. Have you ever felt like you were going to lose your mind? You ever had a job that mentally wore you out? I think, I, I think that's why some of the old folks used to sing that song, Woke Up This Morning With My Mind. They knew that Jesus had to sustain them mentally to get them through. Amen. And I'll just be honest, I, I caught an email one day, and you know I'm from Chicago. And so, you know, if your tone don't come across right in the email, you know, I could, <laughs> I might have to deal with it. So I, email comes across, and I immediately start heading to the office, right? And then something grabbed me on the way and said, no, no, we, you're a little bit different now. We got to go back. And, right, I had, somebody had to work on my mental, right? So we need some physical ability. We need some mental preservation. We need some, thirdly, emotional dexterity. Put right here, finesse, emotional finesse. The example that I love here the most is uh, President Obama. You know, when, 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 you, when you're angry, you, you kind of hold your peace. You know when to uh, uh, show them and when to hold them. You know, you know, President Obama is a great example. You know, there were times during his presidency where he was just beat up on, just people just had everything negative to say about him. 
And I was like, yo, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for him to just... And he, he, he never did that. He was so cool. He was so cool, calm, and collected. He demonstrated some emotional dexterity. And then fourth, the last thing we need is some spiritual fortitude. You can put here 1 Timothy 6 and 11. As for you, man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. I'm, th- I'm thinking of, remember the, the WWJD bracelets? What, what was that for? Everybody had those because it was a reminder that we all need to demonstrate some spiritual fortitude. Those very same things, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfast, those are the things that we need to demonstrate. And that bracelet was a reminder of our spiritual fortitude. So check this out. We've got eight types of trials that we all face. Agreed? We've got four things that we need to deal with them. Physical ability, mental preservation, emotional dexterity, and spiritual fortitude. The question becomes, how do we get that stuff? Where does that come from? Now, we've been in this series for a while called DNA. And if we take the title, the term built to last, the word built has to do with something called construction, how it's put together. The DNA of our anatomy, of our biology, is, it's nothing more than the biological al- algorithms that make up who we are as, as people, as an individual. And then we look at built to last. That means forever, for a long time. What's forever? What's what's forever? So I looked, I researched, I said, "Ah, what are some of the things that are built to last? Ford had a slogan, built Ford tough. Fords don't last forever. (laughs) Uh, I thought, well, let me go to the kitchen. Maybe I'll talk to Jada. You know, I always talk about my grandmother, right? So my grandmother had these cast iron skillets, right? They were both for uh, cooking, uh, especially fried chicken, and bopping somebody upside the head if, if she needed to, right? But those were, those were pretty strong. But, but th- then I thought, ah, I know. Diamonds. Diamonds are forever. Anybody like diamonds? Yeah. I, one carat, two carat, three carat, four. It don't matter how many, just as long as they're some diamonds, right? Well, 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 if you, got, if you have diamonds on and you think you just got it like that, I don't mean to bust your bubble, but there is no difference. Let me rephrase that. There is only a very small difference between a diamond and a number two pencil. You had a rock on your finger and a number two, a pencil, are essentially the same thing. One's worth hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. One's worth, how much is a number two pencil now? I don't even know where you go to buy one. 25 cents? One's worth about 25 cents. <laughs> right? Smiley, how are they the same? Well, both of them are nothing more than carbon. Carbon the same matter, the same type of material. Diamonds and pencils have the exact same DNA. They're constructed, the same. yet one we value highly, and the other one, we don't, I, if I, I, what do you do, who cares about, matter of fact, give me a pen, I don't even want a pencil. <laughs> I don't even want to use a pencil, right? But what makes the diamond so much more valuable than the pencil. Here it is. Same matter, same DNA, right? The only difference is how the DNA of a diamond is aligned, what it's bonded to, and what it's been through. The only difference between a diamond and a pencil is what it's bonded to and what it's 
been through. The anatomy and the DNA is the same. However, what happens to a diamond is the diamond, the, the atomic structure of a diamond aligns itself in such a way, and those bonds become tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. And when those bonds become tighter, some pressure is applied. Remember, it's dark coal. It has to go through some heat. It has to go through some pain. It has to go through some situations. It has to go through some issues in order for it to become the diamond that it is. So what's the difference between your old DNA and your new DNA? If we look, if we took a look at our DNA, it would look something like that internally. That's what our DNA would look like as it floats through our bodies. And I know, I know folks like to throw up how you were originally constructed. They like to point out your old DNA. Just look at those situations and you let them know. Remember I told you earlier, we can put, these, we can put our situations on notice. We can put our, our, our haters on notice that God has built us to last. Listen, I understand. Yes, I've dealt with some abandonment. I've had some church hurt. I used to be on drugs. I've had some medical issues. But obviously, you did not get a ticket to my reconstruction party. That was the way that I used to be. But as I traveled down the highway of life, I met a man named Jesus. And when that happened, he was a man born of kingship, yet he was born in a major. He was talked about and ridiculed unjustly. His friends sold him out. He was beaten, whipped, drugged, spat on, pierced. Nailed to a despicable, disgraceful cross. Died and buried. But God built him to last. The same Savior who went through all of that, some sisters on the way to visit the tomb, found a stone, rolled away. And it's all because of his love for us. It's all because of his love for us that we now are bonded with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Christ, our Redeemer. Take a look at your situations. Take a look at your circumstances. And you tell them face to face, it's okay. I can handle the pressure because it's the stuff diamonds are made of. How do you get your brilliant luster? God built us to last. All made possible by love. Colossians 3 and 14. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. DNA is about love. Our reconstructed DNA is about love. There would not have been an opportunity for us to have it had we not been there. I will leave you with the words of a song my grandmother used to sing. I was sinking deep in sin, deeply far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters lifted me. Now safe am I. Love God built you to last. Father God, how we thank you for this word. God, the truth is 
sometimes as we face our daily lives, we find ourselves in a position where we're just not sure. Don't know if we're going to make it. Don't know how we're going to get out. But God, because of love, you have given us some things that give us the ability to withstand. We completely put our trust in you. We surrender to your will. We take our hands off the steering wheel and ask that you would guide us and that you would lead us. God, I thank you for reconstruction. I thank you for the ability through love that I have a new DNA. A DNA that says this is not the end. That eternal life in salvation, a chance and an opportunity to see your face because of what you did on the cross. We thank you for it. We love you. In Jesus' name.